Hey there! It's me Eden. If you are new to the channel then please subscribe to my channel and visit my Patreon page for early access, link in the comment, thanks. I slipped right back into the normal school routine the next day. I turned in all my assignments and spent some extra time with each of my teachers to show that I had done the work. I also took makeup exams in several of my classes while the class was in session and Miss Boyer had me stay after school to go over my French language assignments. I met mom as she was getting ready to leave and rode home with her. Carol had avoided staying over by being permitted to take all of her makeup exams during class hours. The basketball season was almost over but we would have two more games as cheerleaders before hanging up our uniforms. I was the center of attention wherever I went for several days after my return. It seemed that most everyone had seen the car commercials at the mall and the word quickly spread that I had been in the movie with Cole Griffith. I must have been asked 50 times if I had gotten his phone number. Knowing all too well that privacy is something that most actors cherish I wouldn't have given it out even if I did have it, which I didn't. By Friday, things had returned to normal. For the first week back Brad tried to get to me between every class to walk me to my next. I knew that that would taper off quickly because it was difficult for him to reach me between a couple of the class periods. Mr. Daniels called the week after we returned from New York to ask that we come out to California over spring break so that I would be available for interviews. Mom fixed the dates with him so that he could make whatever arrangements and plans were needed. The second weekend that we were back I went to the mall with Carol, Sherry, and Heather so that I could see the videos that they were playing at the car show. It was the final weekend of the show and it might be my last opportunity. I hadn't seen any of the commercials on television yet and I wondered if something was wrong. I wore my disguise wig, flats, and normal clothes so that I wouldn't attract attention. When I saw the videos I couldn't see anything wrong. I didn't move wrong, my speech was clear and distinct, and my facial expressions were as I intended. If anything, I came off looking a little too sexy and suggestive as I interacted with the male models on the sets. I wondered if my behavior would entice anyone to buy a car or at least come to the showroom to look at one. After visiting the car show, we all went shopping for the rest of the afternoon. I hadn't seen anyone selling pictures with a cardboard cut out of me, or I might have been tempted to buy one to compare my disguise. On Saturday night, Brad and I went to a party at the house of one of his football teammates. Carol went with Vinnie DeMarco. Since the party was mostly football players and cheerleaders, we knew everyone there. For the party, I had dressed the way that Brad preferred. I was poured into a black, leather skirt, silver, low-cut blouse that showed my cleavage, and black for inch heels. To the football players on the team I wasn't Crystal Ramsey the actress, I was first and foremost Brad's girl. None of them would ever ask me to dance but Brad pulled me to the dance floor whenever a slow dance was played. He didn't grope me when we danced, he just wrapped his large arms around me and put his head down next to mine while I put my arms around his neck. Occasionally he would nibble or nuzzle my ear. When we weren't dancing we talked together in small groups and we left the party at 12.30 because Brad wanted some time in the car outside of my house. It took 15 minutes to get home so we played the game until 1 o'clock. Carol and Vinny had been close behind us and they reached the house a couple of minutes after we did. When we heard the doors slam on Vinny's car, Brad backed off enough so that I could see the clock on the dash. It was one minute before one, so Brad got out while I wiped off my lipstick. As usual, he walked around and lifted me out, then carried me to the door. I gave him a final goodnight kiss as Carol opened the door. I said goodnight and closed the door as I entered the house. Debbie picked me up right after lunch on Sunday. This was the first time that we had been able to get together. 
There weren't any plays or anything to interfere with our day. Brad had wanted to go to the movies, but I told him that I was going shopping with Debbie. However, instead of going shopping, we went to her grandmother's house. This was the first time that we had been here since last fall. Her grandmother was still in the nursing home and most likely would never return to this house. Debbie turned on the stereo while I got a couple of sodas from the kitchen, and then we sat on the couch to talk. Where's your boyfriend today? Debbie asked. I told Brad that I was going shopping with you. We have the rest of the afternoon. So tell me about your movie. It's not my movie. I just had a small part. I play the ex-girlfriend of Cole Griffith. We spent three weeks shooting the segments that I was in and I froze my feet off. You mean your ass. No, I mean my feet. They gave me these awful boots to wear. They were made for indoor use, not the frigidly cold sidewalks in New York City. So what was he like? Like most other guys, except that he's famous. He's a good actor. He's got charisma in front of the camera. Only the camera? Okay, he's got charisma all the time. He's a nice guy. He hasn't been a star long enough to be full of himself. And, I didn't spend any time with him except on the set. And I didn't kiss him off camera. That's what I like to hear. Come air. I slid over next to Debbie and she put her arm around me and then kissed me. We kissed for perhaps 15 minutes before Debbie placed her hand on my left breast and squeezed it gently. She stopped kissing me for a moment and said, These breast forms are amazing. They feel just like real breasts. I guess the time had come to tell her some of the facts so I said, I don't wear breast forms anymore. My breasts are real. Debbie gave me a funny look and said, Real? Your breasts are real. No way. I was there at the beginning, remember? Uh. Well, the adhesive that was used to affix the breasts contained something that had the effect of making my breasts grow. What? No way. What's the gag? I'm not going to let you pull one over on me. I know that your breasts aren't real. I unbuttoned my blouse and took it off. Then I reached back and unclasped my bra. All the time Debbie was watching me closely, expecting me to stop and admit that I was kidding. As I dropped the bra she reached out and pinched my left breast. I screamed from the pain and Debbie recoiled in shock. As the nipple changed shape slightly in my body's reaction to the pain in the breast and the color of the skin grew red, Debbie looked at me in horror. Oh my god, they're real. That's what I said. And that hurt. I. I'm sorry. I thought that you were kidding. Unfortunately no, or that wouldn't have hurt. But how? I told you. There was something in the adhesive that promoted the development of breasts. The adhesive was designed for women to wear breast forms. The manufacturer didn't expect a male to be wearing the breasts long term. After the initial period I had to maintain the disguise so the same adhesive was used again. That was before we were aware of the facts. By the time we learned of the potential problem, my system was already involved in developing the breasts. But they're so big. How large will they get? I don't know, but they're approaching a C cup in size. I hope that they don't get much bigger. Can't they do something? What about breast reduction surgery? I can't do that until after I make enough money to pay for our college expenses. But you are going to have it done? I thought that you liked me like this. Well, I do, but it makes me feel like a lesbian. I mean, knowing that you have real breasts. But it's still me underneath. I know. 
Oh, I don't know. I don't know what I mean. It's just that I didn't expect it. I'm just shocked. Here I've been thinking that you were just a guy who was playing this gigantic hoax on everyone and getting away with it, and now I learn that you're almost a girl. But I'm not, not exactly. I don't have a vagina, and I can't have sex like a woman. I just have breasts. Debbie looked at me with a strange expression on her face. I'm sorry for pinching you. I was just caught off guard. I leaned over and kissed her. She responded and in a few moments we were locked together in a passionate embrace. As we kissed, she fondled my breasts, and I hers. We kissed for about 20 minutes before taking a break. You know, Debbie said, I kind of like this. Maybe all guys should have breasts. I giggled. I don't think that that would ever work. Guys already have something that flops around when they run naked. Debbie laughed. I just got a picture of that in my mind, a guy with big boobs, running naked. And he can only hold two things at a time to keep them from flopping. I giggled again. It is kind of a funny picture. I'm hungry. How about some popcorn? Okay. Do you have a popper? I have some microwave stuff. It's pretty good. It only takes a few minutes and comes out all buttered. Let's go make it. While Debbie walked to the kitchen I put my bra and blouse back on. When I got to the kitchen the popcorn was almost ready. Debbie got out a big plastic bowl and dumped the contents of the bag into it when the microwave shut off. We grabbed some ice cubes to add to our sodas and went back to the living room. Debbie turned off the stereo and popped a cassette into the VCR, then turned on the television and turned it to channel 3. The movie began to play as we sat back on the couch. I held the popcorn bowl as Debbie put her arm around me and grabbed a handful of popcorn. We really got into the movie. It was titled A Walk in the Clouds starring Keena Reeves as a GI during World War II. I couldn't believe that I hadn't heard of it before because I enjoyed it immensely. After the movie ended we spent some more time in lip locks. As it approached the time when I had to be home for dinner, we cleaned up the popcorn mess, fixed our makeup and hair, and left. I invited Debbie to have dinner with us but she had to go somewhere with her parents, so she dropped me off at the house and pulled away as I waved and walked into the house. Spring vacation started the following weekend. Brad was disappointed to hear that I was leaving for California on Saturday. He had thought that we'd be able to spend most of our vacation days together. We got to the condo late Saturday. It had been sealed for months and had that dead air smell to it. We opened up the windows and within a few hours it smelled fine again. The outside air temperature dropped to about 60 after the sun went down so we closed the windows except for a narrow opening. Cooking dinner filled the condo with the delightful aroma of spaghetti sauce. It was jar sauce but we didn't have any fresh food in the house so we were making it. We will do our shopping tomorrow. We took care of the food shopping early on Sunday so that we would have the day to relax. Carol and I spent the afternoon out by the pool. Mom joined us for a couple of hours but left early fearing that the sun would be too much. We had used what seemed like a pint of number 30 sunblock to keep from getting burned. Mr. Daniels had scheduled me for a number of interviews during the following week. I went on interviews for two new television series, three commercials, and two movies. The interviews didn't last more than five minutes each and after each interview they thanked me and said that they'd be in touch. Nobody gave me any real signs of encouragement but even with the running around it was fun being in California again. When we weren't working, we went sightseeing. On Saturday, we packed up and took the afternoon flight home. Since we had only been away for a week, and since it was a vacation week as well, 
there wasn't any catch-up required for school. But we were only back home a few days when Mr. Daniels called to say that I was wanted back in California for callbacks. I was still under consideration for one of the new television shows and one of the movies, so on Saturday we returned to California again. On Monday I met with the movie people. This time, both the executive producer, Mr. Tinker, and the director, Mr. Marin, were there for the reading, as well as the casting people and various assistants. I was given a script that had parts from three scenes marked up and allowed to study them for half an hour. Then I was called in and I read the part that I was assigned while an assistant read the other parts. As before, the entire session was recorded with a video camera. After the reading I answered questions about myself. Most of the stuff was already available from the agency so I guess that they were just trying to get to know me a little. In all I spent about two hours in the interview. Tuesday was similar, except with different people at a different location. The show had produced a pilot and had been picked up by a network but they wanted a few changes made before it went into production. Two new characters were being added, one was being removed, and two actors from the pilot were being replaced. The location of the show was being changed, and the occupation of the male lead. It sounded like an entirely different show to me, but that wasn't my concern at this point. I read what they told me and answered their questions honestly. Although I wasn't known well enough to get new work without interviews, my past job history helped and with each new job I would have more of a track record. My previous work, an agent, enabled me to be considered for good parts instead of having to battle my way up through the ranks of extras and other newcomers at open cattle calls. We left for home on Tuesday afternoon after the second interview. Although the snow had all disappeared back home, it was still very cold compared to the nice weather in California. It would still be a month before the temperatures rose high enough to be comfortable outside for long periods without heavy winter clothing, but nice weather was coming. On Friday, about a week after we returned home, Mr. Daniels called to say that the movie company was very interested in me and that I might get the part if we could work out the details. The part wasn't one of the leads, but it was an important supporting role. Mr. Daniels spoke to Mom about the shooting schedule and tried to determine if I was available. They would begin in two months and it would last through most of the summer. It would mean that I wouldn't be able to participate in the community theater production again but this one part would pay enough to guarantee that both Carol's and my schooling was paid for and cover the medical expenses for my sex change back to a male. The snag was that the movie company was requiring a three-picture signing contract for all of the main characters, so that sequels could be made, since they were only shooting the first third of a three-part story. The clause would only take effect if the picture was a financial success, with a prearranged salary formula based on the box office gross of the picture and each actor's value at the time the next picture was committed to. The amount that I would earn for just the first picture, even if it were a flop, would mean that I would have enough money so that I could revert to my former identity. But, the special clause meant that I couldn't change until the contract was fulfilled. Of course we never said anything of my inner turmoil to Mr. Daniels, and I knew that it would be difficult for him to understand if I chose to turn down the deal. There was also the possibility that he would stop representing me or at the least promoting me, if I turned down a three-picture deal worth as much as several million dollars if all three pictures were made. At 10%, the agency commission would be at least $300,000. The main problem was that the three pictures could be spaced out over as much as a five-year period. That would mean that I would have to remain like this all through college. The thought that Mr. Daniels might stop promoting me and I might not get enough work to even pay for schooling sent a shiver down my spine. I didn't know what to do. We stalled Mr. Daniels by informing him that final exams were being given the week that they wanted to start shooting. This was true, and we would have to find out if we could make arrangements to take the exams earlier, 
or possibly later, so that my entire school year wasn't wasted. I didn't think about anything else that night. We discussed it over dinner and developed options. Of course, Carol wanted me to take the deal. I definitely think that you should do it, cries. Forget about the money. I just love having a little sister. We've had so much fun since Carrie went to stay with Daddy. Carol, have a little compassion for your sister's feelings, Mom said. She's coping as best she can. She knows that if she remains as she is for the next five years, it will become harder and harder to change back. She may never be able to become Carrie again if she doesn't do it before entering college. Looking at me, Mom said, we'll support your decision, honey. I know how difficult all this is for you. My college education, and Carol's, was being dangled out in front of me like a carrot on the stick, but I knew that the stick was really a fishing pole and that there was a hook in that carrot. If I reached for it, I could have the carrot, but I would be hooked into remaining as Crystal, possibly for years. If I ignored it, I risked not getting any more acting work. My feelings kept seesawing back and forth between taking the job and turning it down. I decided to sleep on it before making a decision. I lay awake for hours thinking about the problem. Although I had been living as a female for almost 10 months now, deep down I always thought that I would change back to being a male. I knew that with each passing day of living as a woman, that change became more difficult. The decision that I face now might well determine my fate for the rest of my life. It was true that I had been more successful as a female than I ever was as a male, but was that any reason to forsake my male identity? Did I want to be a female for the rest of my life? If not, could I accept being a female for five more years, and would I still be able to change back? My head was aching from the stress so I got out of bed and took several aspirins. When I went back to bed I tried to forget about the problem for tonight. I did my best to clear my mind, focusing on an imaginary blank, white wall. At some point I managed to drift off to sleep, but it was a troubled sleep. Although I consciously wanted to stop thinking about the problem, my subconscious apparently had other priorities. I tossed and turned in a fitful semblance of sleep. I was late getting out of bed in the morning, probably due to my troubled sleep. Mom and Carol had already eaten, but Mom got up to fix my breakfast when I came in. I just sat in silence and drank a glass of OJ until the eggs were ready. When Mom put the eggs down in front of me and sat down in her chair, I said, I've decided. Both Mom and Carol looked at me intently. After a few seconds of silence Carol said, Well, what is it? I'm not ready to commit myself for five years. I would do the picture in a heartbeat if it wasn't for the multi-picture clause. Since I don't want to risk losing Mr. Daniels as an agent, and since we can't tell him the real reason, I want to tell him that we must take the exams when scheduled and are therefore unable to take the picture deal. If that doesn't anger him too much, he'll continue to be my agent and I'm sure that he'll find me other jobs. There's no guarantee that the picture will be successful, Carol said. Maybe it'll be a loser and then you'll regret not taking the job. This would be your opportunity to make all the money that we need with just one job. And how about if you turn it down and get a new television series instead? They're going to want to sign you to a long-term contract also so that the series doesn't suffer from the loss of a key member. That's true. I hadn't considered that. I guess that I can't take any serious work either. I'll have to concentrate on commercials and minor roles in single-picture deals. I wonder what Mr. Daniels will think if you turn down a television series after turning down the movie. I thought for a few seconds. I don't know, and that worries me more than anything else. I know that I can't keep turning down million-dollar offers without a good reason. I was just lucky that this picture is starting the same week as final exams. 
It gives me an easy out. Okay, honey, mom said. If that's what you want, I'll tell Mr. Daniels how devastated you are about having to turn down the picture, but that we can't possibly reschedule the exams and that prevents you from signing. I'm sure that he'll continue to look for more jobs for you. I also think that Carol has a point. If he lines up another long-term, well-paying job, and you turn it down, he may decide that his time would be better spent promoting someone else. Maybe we should try to think of a believable excuse so that he doesn't seek out those kinds of jobs in the first place? We tossed out several ideas as we thought of them but someone always pointed out their weak points. We just couldn't come up with a good reason for turning down the millions of dollars that could be earned from long-term projects. Mom called Mr. Daniels on Monday and explained that I would love to do the movie but that we had to turn it down since shooting started during exam week and they couldn't be rescheduled. He understood that I didn't want to have to repeat my entire year because I didn't take final exams. He promised to continue working on other projects for me. During the following week we saw one of the tuna fish commercials for the first time. They had been shot against a blue screen and I saw that they had done a great job in the post-production work. The final cut showed me eating a tuna sandwich with a tropical island in the background. I hoped that it would have a long run. A little later, on the late local news, Mom heard my name mentioned and turned up the volume. Carol was on the phone and I was in the kitchen but we both stopped what we were doing when we heard the television blasting. We made it into the living room just in time to hear the announcement. The announcer said that the movie company had released information about their new picture, Open Spaces, Closed Hearts, which would begin shooting in June, and that I was named among the five actors who had been signed to do the picture. I looked at Mom. Didn't you tell Mr. Daniels that I couldn't do it? Yes, I did. I told him that you were devastated that you had to turn it down but that exams couldn't be rescheduled. Then why are they saying that I'm going to be in it? I don't know. I'll have to call Mr. Daniels tomorrow and find out. The following morning the news was all over the school. Everywhere I went people congratulated me on getting the role in the new movie. At first I tried to tell people that it was all a mistake but then I just gave up. I was sure that a corrected press release would be sent out. After all, I would be here in school while they were shooting. When mom arrived home she cleared up the mystery. We sat at the kitchen table as she related the story. It seemed that Mr. Daniels had told the movie production company that I would have loved to have had the part, and that the money and other provisions of the offer were satisfactory but that I had a scheduling conflict with my school's final exams week. He told them that it was impossible for me to be there when they wanted to start shooting, so I, reluctantly, had to decline. The producer's assistant at the movie company had expressed her regret and promptly reported the message to the producer. A week had passed without Mr. Daniels hearing from the movie company again. And then yesterday they called to say that, after reviewing the videos made during the readings, as well as other clips of me that had been sent to them by the agency, they had decided that I was perfect for the part and felt that I would fit in better with the rest of the cast than the other actresses that had made it to the final selection process. For those reasons they were rescheduling the start of shooting so that I could take my exams and then travel to the location to begin shooting. Since they believed that I had already agreed to the other terms, and they had now removed the only obstacle, they had added my name to the list of company members. A press agent had released the information without realizing that I hadn't signed the contract yet. Oh, no. What am I going to do now? We'll just tell them that you can't do it, Mom said. They shouldn't have released that information without having the signed contract but they've gone to the trouble of rescheduling the start date for me. That means that I'm responsible for everyone's schedule being changed, the entire cast and crew. Plus, all of the other things that have to be changed, 
such as transportation arrangements, equipment rentals, lodging, food, etc., etc., etc. If I back out now, I'll have a reputation of being a troublemaker, or at the very least, being difficult. I won't get any more work and we can forget our college plans. Even Mr. Daniels won't understand this. I'm finished, unless I take the job. The entertainment community may be enormous, but it's like a small town when it comes to scandal or gossip. We sat around the table thinking about the situation. All of the excuses that we came up with were lame and questionable. The only thing that seemed somewhat plausible was objection to the clause calling for a multi-movie deal. But even there our arguments didn't seem reasonable. The salary for future movies would escalate according to the box office receipts of the previous one so salary couldn't be an issue. And since the movie company had already shown a willingness to reschedule, time conflicts couldn't be a major issue either. The only valid excuse seemed to be the real one, and we certainly couldn't announce that. Besides which it would effectively end my ability to get real parts. I would be reduced to seeking work in a niche of markets that would attempt to exploit my condition. After about an hour of sitting at the table without being able to solve the problem, we decided to start preparing dinner. We continued to think about it for the rest of the evening but no one came up with a good idea on how I could get out of it and still survive in the industry as if nothing had happened. Mr. Daniels had sent out the contracts by FedEx so they would arrive in the morning. They had to be signed and returned right away, so we only had until tomorrow to find a solution. I had trouble concentrating on my homework later because I couldn't get the movie problem out of my mind. When Brad called I told Carol to tell him that I couldn't speak to him tonight. I wasn't in a mood to talk with anyone. Brad probably thought that it was that time of the month. It took me twice as long as it should have, but I finally finished my homework and put my books away. I was then able to concentrate fully on the problem. I kept thinking back to when I had first become Crystal. The situation was similar. I had felt trapped after finding that the breast forms couldn't be removed for a week, and I numbly allowed myself to be talked into continuing the masquerade. As it turned out, my entire life had changed for the better. Could this be another attempt by fate to have my life continue down this path? Was I destined to remain a woman for a while longer? How long? Forever? If so, then why had I been born a male at all? Once in bed I tossed and turned as sleep eluded me. There seemed to be just two choices either accept the job and all of the benefits that came with it while accepting the fact that I was going to be crystal for at least five more years, or refuse the job and possibly say goodbye to college except for the local two-year school. I finally managed to fall asleep. In the morning mom asked if I had reached a decision. I answered slowly and deliberately, yes, I think that I have to accept the job, and I'll hope that the film is not so successful that they want to make a sequel. We'll make enough on the first movie to pay for college and medical expenses. We'll put the money for the transition into the bank and wait until we know about the chance for sequels? I didn't express the misgivings that I felt about the decision because I didn't want to further burden mom with matters that she couldn't do anything to change. Okay, dear. And what about other jobs that come up in the meantime? Well, I'll take everything decent that I'm offered for as long as I'm crystal. I might as well make the best of it, or rather the most of it. Then I'll sign the papers and return them to Mr. Daniels today and if he asks I'll tell him that you're ready for any other work that he can find. I felt better now that the decision had been made, although I still felt uneasy with the knowledge that I was sentenced to remain as a woman for up to five more years. No, that wasn't right. I'm not really a woman. I only look like one, with one very important difference. I couldn't have normal sex as either gender. 
It began to appear that I would be the world's oldest virgin in five years. Fortunately, my medicine kept my sex drive in check. It would be much worse to feel the need and not be able to satisfy it, even if I had to do it alone. Cheerleading tryouts took my attention back to school issues. One third of the cheerleaders would be graduating and had to be replaced. About a hundred girls showed up for the tryouts and we slowly identified the ones that we would admit. Carol and I did everything we could to make sure that the selections were not limited to the I write part of town and succeeded in getting two girls approved that might otherwise not have made it. A few weeks later I received the script for the movie, by FedEx Delivery. I hadn't read the original script, but the sections that I had read from during the interview had been expanded a little. Perhaps they had reduced my part in other sections. I wondered if the script changes had anything to do with the schedule change. Had they even had to rewrite the script to accommodate me? No, that was a ludicrous idea. The changes were just part of the normal rewriting that goes on constantly during a production. I began studying the script at every opportunity and within two weeks I knew all my lines, plus most of those of the other actors. The script called for me to drive at one point, so mom took me to get a learner's permit and I started taking lessons with one of the local driving schools. Since I would only be 17 in a few months there were restrictions as to what hours I would be able to drive but I looked forward to the new freedom that I would have during the daylight hours. Carol, upon hearing that I was getting my license, got mom to sign her up also and we took the course together. By the time that we were to leave for the movie location, both Carol and I should have our driver's licenses. Carol would be 19 a couple of months after school started in the fall, so she would have full driver's privileges. My time with Brad and Debbie suffered during May as I worked on the script and learned to drive while also finishing up the school year, but as school activities wound down in June, I started making as much time for leisure activities as possible. Once I arrived on the movie set, I expected long hours for the rest of the summer. At the end of May, Carol and I got our prom dresses for the senior prom. Carol was going with Vinnie DeMarco, and I was naturally going with Brad. I had had my prom dress fitted while I wore a corset so the waist was a little less than 19 inches. I had even talked Carol into wearing a corset for the prom so her waist was just over 20 inches. Once the dresses were altered she didn't have any choice but to go through with it, so for three weeks she wore a corset to train her waist. It seemed that she never stopped complaining about it, but I think that secretly she was thrilled with the way that she looked. That and the fact that her girlfriends were sure jealous with the difference in her figure. When exam time finally arrived I didn't know if I was happy or sad. I enjoyed acting work but I also remembered the fun that we had had last summer up at the lake. I wondered if Jason and Barry would be spending the summer up there again this year. After I had taken my last exam I breathed a huge sigh of relief. I was sure that I had done fairly well. I knew that I hadn't aced all of them but I expected that I scored high enough to ensure that I would be in a good position for getting into the college of my choice. The senior prom was held on the evening of the day after the last day of exams. Carol and I had appointments at the hair salon for 2 o'clock and by 5 o'clock we were headed home. We had done as much as we could the evening before so we were able to get ready in time for Brad and Vinny's expected arrival at 7.30. As we descended the stairs, both boys whistled. Vinny especially was in awe because he had never seen Carol with the hourglass figure that the corset gave her. She had only been wearing loose-fitting clothing while she was adjusting to the corset. Her dress showed off her figure to perfection. The boys both looked fantastic in their tuxedos and we told them so. After we had affixed the corsages, Mom used up an entire roll of film taking pictures of us in our formal wear. It was nearing 8 o'clock when we finally got out of the house. 
Since it was such a special occasion we didn't have to be home until 2 o'clock but I knew that mom would be waiting for us. The boys had arranged for a limo for the evening. The white stretch limo felt like a coach out of a fairy tale as the four of us traveled to the prom. The mood in the gym was festive when we arrived. Exams were over and graduation was only two days away. A few of the kids already had a buzz on either from booze or drugs or both. As we entered we were asked to vote for prom king and prom queen. Both Brad and Carol were among the nominees so I didn't have any difficulty making my selections. At 9 o'clock the senior class president asked the band to stop playing while some announcements were made. The chairperson of the prom committee called for quiet as she announced the results of the voting for prom king and queen. First she announced that the prom king for this year was Bradley Franklin Reese. Brad was surprised, but happy. He got up from the table, bent over to kiss me, and then walked up onto the temporary stage, where he was crowned. He stood there as the chairperson went to the mic again and announced that the queen for the prom was Carol Lynn Ramsey. Carol was astounded. She couldn't believe her ears. She had tears in her eyes as she stood up and half walked and half ran to the stage. She was crying as the crown was placed onto her head, and I was crying also. It was wonderful to see her honored like this. I had often worried about all the attention that was paid to me while she had to just sit and watch. I wouldn't ever be happier than I was at that moment. Carol was given a little time to fix her face and then she and Brad posed for pictures, both together and with their court. Brad asked the photographer to take a picture of him and I, so I joined him for a shot. He also paid to have a picture taken in front of the small set that a photographer had set up in the hall just outside the gym. Most of the dances being played at the prom were slow so Brad and I spent a lot of time on the dance floor. For the last hour only slow dances were played. Just before one o'clock the band played their last song and said goodnight. A lot of the kids had left already but there was still a sizable number there. A lot of suggestions were being tossed around as to where to go next and we joined a group that was going for pizza. Our limo was waiting at the curb when we emerged from the school and we climbed in. Brad instructed the driver to take us to the restaurant and we found ourselves in a small convoy, with us in the lead. The restaurant was closed and we were there in five minutes. As we were the first ones in, Brad ordered the pies and then he and Vinny set about pulling a bunch of tables together. As more people arrived, more tables were used until only the occupied tables were left outside our group. They started bringing the pies over as soon as they came out of the oven and everybody started grabbing. The first couple of pies disappeared in seconds, but by the time that the tenth pie was delivered we still had several full pies on the table. Both Carol and I only had one piece each. The corsets wouldn't allow any more than that when combined with half a cup of soda. Brad and Vinny got us home by two o'clock. Instead of the usual a game that we played in the four by four, Brad's only recourse tonight was a few simple kisses at the door. I guess that the audience of the limo driver and Carol and Vinny dampened his ardor a bit. He said that he would call me in the morning and we said good night, followed by a final kiss. As we climbed the stairs to the bedrooms, Carol said, I can't wait to get out of this corset. Hurry up, I'm dying. Yes, your majesty. She grinned and swatted me on my tush. We got up a little later than normal on Saturday even though we had a lot to do. The graduation ceremony was tomorrow at noon and we had plane reservations at 5.30 for Idaho, the location where the movie was being filmed. We would have to pack for an extended stay, clean out the perishable food in the refrigerator, and take care of a dozen other tasks. Mom had stopped the paper, arranged for the lawn to be kept trimmed, and arranged for mail to be held at the post office. 
A friend of hers from work would stop over every few days and check on the house and water the plants. I spoke with Brad and told him that I could talk for a while but that I wouldn't be able to see him today. I will see him at the graduation ceremony tomorrow, of course. At noon we left to attend Debbie's graduation ceremony. We sat with her parents and clapped loudly when Debbie appeared from the school and marched to the graduating student area, and again when she walked up onto the stage to get her diploma. Before and after the ceremony, I was besieged by fans who recognized me and wanted my autograph. It was lucky that the school was a small one and the crowd was limited in size. Debbie and I hugged after the ceremony. I hoped that we would have time to get together after I returned from the movie location and before she left for college. She invited us back to her house for a small party with friends and relatives and I would have loved to have gone, but we still had too much to do, so we had to beg off. She understood that we were leaving tomorrow and with Carol graduating also, we just couldn't make it. I gave her the small graduation present that I had picked up for her. It was a small heart-shaped locket that I had engraved with the sentiment, with love, see. We hugged once more and I said good. Bye. To her and her parents. I felt saddened by the fact that I wouldn't see Debbie for the rest of the summer, but there was still so much to do that I didn't have time to dwell on it. By bedtime we had almost everything done. We would each finish packing our last suitcase after we got back from Carol's graduation tomorrow. Things were a bit hectic in the morning. We ate, bathed, and then got ready to go to the graduation ceremony. Mom took a bunch of pictures of Carol in her cap and gown and then we left for the school. While Carol went to join the other graduates in preparation for their walk out to the ceremony area, Mom and I went to find seats. We ran into Brad's parents and I introduced them to Mom. We found seats together and Mom and Brad's parents compared notes as parents do everywhere. As expected, much of the conversation revolved around Brad and me. Mrs. Reese invited Mom over the next time that they had a dinner party. Mom explained that we were leaving for the movie location today but thanked her for the invitation and said that perhaps they could get together in the fall. Their conversation trailed off when the graduating students emerged from the school building and paraded onto the football field where the stage was set up. The school board and administrative officials climbed to the stage as the students filled in the rows immediately in front of the stage. We listened to speeches for about a half hour and then the graduates filed up onto the stage and received their diplomas. When the last diploma was handed out and the students had returned to their seats, the principal congratulated them and declared the ceremony over. The graduating class let out a series of cheers while parents and relatives swarmed in to congratulate them. The field slowly cleared over the next half hour as people left to attend graduation parties. I congratulated Brad when I could get to him and gave him the small gift that I had bought for him. It was a 14K gold cross pen. I put a little note in the box, which read, Every attorney needs a good pen to prepare his briefs. I didn't know what a brief looked like, but I had heard somewhere that that's what lawyers prepare. Brad wrapped his arms around me and gave me a long kiss. He knew that it would have to last him for the summer. Carol, Vinny, Sherry, and Heather joined us and we all stood around and talked for about another 15 minutes. Then it was time for tearful goodbyes, hugs, and kisses. Everyone was moving on to a new chapter in their lives. We hurried home to finish up our packing and get going. When we were all set, Mom gave Carol her graduation present. It was a notebook computer with the latest high-speed processor chip. It came with two charged batteries and was filled with games, word processor, and imaging software. Carol wanted to start playing with it right away but the taxi arrived and we had to leave. Once we had checked in at the airport, Carol took out her computer and we played games until the plane was ready to load, 
and we played again while we waited for our connecting flight in Chicago. I'm sure that mom didn't intend for the computer to be just a plaything, but it sure made the time pass quickly. We reached Pocatello, Idaho, via a small commercial jet that made stops in Sioux City, Iowa and Casper, Wyoming before landing in Idaho. We were met by a car from the production company and it took almost an hour's drive to get to the town where the movie was being made. It was late so the driver brought us to a motel about a mile from the shooting location. We had two rooms with a connecting door and we learned that we were lucky to be in a building. Most of the cast and crew were staying in motor homes, mobile homes, trailers, and even tents. I don't think that I could have endured three months in a tent. The driver said that he would be back to pick us up at 7 a.m. It was after 10 p.m. so we unpacked quickly and went to bed. One room had a full-size bed and the other had twin beds, so mom took the single and Carol and I took the twins. At least we had two full bathrooms here unlike the single bath that we had had in New York City. Please subscribe for the next part and visit my Patreon page for early access. Link in the comment, thanks.